On this episode of This Week in Linux, we've got a ton of news. A crazy amount of news, actually. There's, I've limited it for time because it's so much of it. So we'll talk about GNOME's latest release of GNOME 3.38. PinePhone announced there's a now a multi-distro image that has 13 in one. So you can install 13 all-in-one actual image. That is fantastic. I can't wait to try that. Uh, Slimbook Essential, the affordable Linux laptop, has been posted in an article about it on Front Page Linux. We'll talk about that. NVIDIA has actually set to be acquiring ARM for $40 billion. We'll talk about that and what the impacts for that will be. Mozilla is shutting down Firefox Send and Firefox Notes, and we'll talk about that. The XFCE 4.16 beta was released, and we're going to talk about the new features and the release date. Library announced a new platform called Odyssey. We'll talk about that as well. So many things, including Deepin 20 released and some interesting news about the Ubuntu Community Council from Mark Shuttleworth. All that and much more coming up on your weekly source for Linux GNUs. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean and by Bitwarden. Welcome to episode 117 of This Week in Linux, a weekly Linux news podcast part of the Destination Linux network. I'm Michael Tunnell, and if you're new to the show, this is a show that will keep you up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, and I'll give you my take on the latest topics using my over 20 years experience as a Linux user. So let's do a little bit of housekeeping this week. So This Week in Linux is back to live streaming. If you're not aware, I did an awesome, uh, not exaggerated at all announcement video about like the announcement for it's actually a movie trailer style so it has just an excessive amount of just fun in the trailer so if you haven't seen that go check that out but we're doing live streaming for this week in linux episodes now every saturday at 2 p.m eastern so if you're not for, if you didn't if you didn't know that we used to do this we've actually used to do it many many episodes ago and i'm bringing it back but i'm also bringing it back in a a better way so patrons can join me on this live stream as well so uh, lots of cool stuff that's coming so be sure to come to this the streams every saturday at 2 p.m eastern time and for those who are in the utc there is a time zone can converter linked in the description of that video as well as this video. So there you go. And also Destination Linux and Hardware Addicts are podcasts that I'm on in addition to this with This Week in Linux. So if you haven't checked out those podcasts, you definitely need to because those are fantastic. And also be sure to follow me on Twitter and Ma or Mastodon, whichever one you want. And I post them basically equally. And every time there's like a new thing related to the network or just content I'm making, I post it on those. So be sure to check those out if you'd like to be updated much sooner than once a week. Let's get to the show. A first in the show this week is GNOME 3.38. This, they have a new release of the, of the GNOME shell and a lot of stuff, including some application updates and a bunch more. And we're going to talk about the GNOME shell 3.38 in this episode. We might talk about some applications in the next one, but for now, we're just going to talk about the uh, DE uh, release. So they have introduced a new tour application. It's like a welcome tour kind of thing, which is really nice because GNOME's interface is very different from the, a lot of the other ex expectations of interfaces. So it's a good idea for them to do that sort of thing. So I'm glad they did that. They already had a welcome application, but it wasn't as clear as how to do it. So I'm glad that they started, they put work into that. They also have updates from a lot of different other things as in they, they did highly customizable app grid. So you can now drag and drop, reorder shortcuts in the app grid and that sort of stuff. So that's nice. Makes it a lot easier to deal with like creating folders and, and stuff like that inside of the uh, overview for the apps. So I'm really happy to see that. They've also done some improvements for some perennial controls. They, it's easier for parents and teachers to limit access for to certain apps for kids, which is a good idea. Uh, a lot of, most distros and DEs should do that just to make it possible to have that as a feature. But something I really wanted to talk about was just, it's a really cool feature that isn't a big use case, but they also made a thing that it's just anyway I'll get to that uh, it's it's being able to share a Wi-Fi hotspot via QR code so you create the 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 uh, the hot like the set up the connection for the Wi-Fi on your laptop or your desktop and then you can share to your phone that connection with QR code scanning which is just really really cool and they also made a promo video for the release of 3.38 and I just wanted to say if you haven't checked out that video um, it's really good. It's a nice, nicely animated and all kinds of stuff like that. And they also have a section where there's a QR code there. If you haven't scanned it, you should definitely scan it. Uh, it's it, it, if you scan it with your QR code, it opens a Rick roll, which I think is just hilarious. So it is completely random, subtle trolling, and it's just fantastic. Good job, Gnome, on that, that case. Uh, also, 
Uh, they've done some improvements to the system tray or, well, not really a system tray because they don't have a system tray, but, you know, that kind of thing, uh, whatever you want to call it, system menu. Uh, they have improved it where the mic indicator now shows if something is, a, is an active microphone or a muted microphone. They've also added battery percentage to the tray as well. Uh, they've also added where uh, you can now have the restart functionality built into the menu rather than having to click shut down and then the restart, which I always found very weird in like the usability aspect, because it, like every time I even I knew it was there, how they structured it, and I always forget. So when I click, it's like, where's the restart? Like, oh right, right, right. It's it's hidden under shutting down, which is odd. But they have now fixed that. So if you want to check out all the more, I'll have links to the promo video as well as the blog post for their release for GNOME 3.38 to find out more in the show notes below. Up next in the show is a really awesome bit of news that I wanted to talk about, mostly because I think this is just cool, but also I, I happen to have a Pine phone with me, and uh, I can't wait. I love this, by the way, the whole powered by Linux. You can't really see it that well, but it says powered by Linux at the bottom. That I love that. It's a nice touch that they added. Uh, but the Pine phone is a really cool device that is just just a fantastic idea of making Linux the forefront and having mainline Linux as a part of how the base of the core system works. It, it, but the, the biggest thing about Linux is people want to have choices for different uh, distros and different things and interfaces they want to use. And a community member in the PinePhone community uh, by the name of Migos, Migos, I don't, I'm sorry if I mis mispronounced that, uh, produced a multi-boot image for the PinePhone that is able to boot 13 different Linux distributions all in one uh, image. So it allows testing for basically every distro without needing to use multiple micro SD cards or reflashing the internal flash st uh, storage or any of that stuff. So this is just really cool. And all Linux, all 13 distributions share the same Linux kernel of 5.9. And so it only needs one copy to have it all worked, uh, have it all working. So it allows all 13 to fit on this one, uh, one flash card or S micro SD card. And it also gives you the support for using uh, Arch Linux ARM, KDE Neon, Luno OS, Mamo Lesti, is that? I don't know, yeah, Mobian, Postmarket OS with multiple different variants uh, with different interfaces and stuff like that. Also Pure OS, uh, Selfish OS, and Ubuntu Touch. So I am looking forward to playing with all of these. Uh, there are some issues of saying like it's not exactly perfect to have everything. So if you once you try it and find the one you want, you still might want to uh, you like reflash the gen like the regular image because that way it's all of the like the as optimized as much as possible. Because this they they still had to do some kind of uh, compromises to make every single thing work. So some things might not work as well as they would be on the regular images. So just keep that in mind if you do decide to use this. I will be trying this out to just kind of play with all the different options really quickly. But once I do choose the you know which one I want to use, I will then just you know switch it over to the like the regular image from that project. Uh, Migo says uh, it's, it's uh, really cool features like pre-created uh, ButterFS snapshots that restore the original state of the. Uh, included distributions in case something goes wrong, which is very cool. So you not only have the multi-distro image, you also have a snapshotting system built into it. Very cool. But the quirks exist are uh, distributions at some time. This is actually quotes from the Migos' website. Uh, so distributions add weird hacks to their kernels to work around issues with some camera apps th that they use. This is not the right way to fix issues with inadequate camera apps, and therefore these apps don't work in this multi-boot image because my kernel doesn't have these hacks built into it. Uh, he says, I've tried to make my kernel compatible with most distributions, but most distributions don't update the kernel often enough or run outdated and unsupported versions of the kernel. So there may be some subtle compatibility issues. Some things may work better. Some things may break. So that's the kind of the point about like there. It's not necessarily like the perfect solution to run uh, on the phone at all times. But if you want to try out everything in a much easier way to do so, this is a fantastic option. And I cannot wait to play with this right after the show. Well, not right after, but very soon after the show, though, so this is going to be really cool. And if you'd like to learn more about this, I'll have links to all this stuff in the show notes below.
Up next in the show is the Slimbook Essential. This is a Linux laptop that is arguably very affordable in comparison to other options. And uh, this is really cool because the prices for a la Linux laptop are typically in the $900 range or more based on the availability of hardware and being able to do bulk orders and that sort of stuff. So if, if you're not aware, manufacturers get lower level pricing or for like those budget laptops that are in the $400 level or that kind of thing uh, by doing bulk orders over, you know, thousands and thousands of, 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 of units in those laptops. So making it possible for them to, to lower the cost because they can sell more. And that's just not something that the Linux uh, hardware world has had for a very long time. And I'm not sure if this is the case for Slimbook, if they're able to do this or how they're able to do this, but they are making their laptops a lot, a lot cheaper than expected from their previous models. So this is a 499 euros or in the US dollars it's $600. So this is a it's a much cheaper thing but it's still in a mid-tier uh, situation so it's not like this it's not a super low budget laptop but it is nice to see that they're lowering the prices to that to being able to make it possible for do that so maybe in the future they can make it even lower so let's talk about the hardware so this is a 14 er, there's two different models the 14 inch and the 15 inch both are 1080p displays they both have uh, a 180 degree degree hinge that allows you to lay the the, the the screen back completely flat I don't know what value there is in doing that but you can so that's cool and uh, this has uh, different options for the CPU. You got three different options. You have the i3, i5, or i7 models. And they also have uh, integrated graphics. And they have up to 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, what's really cool about this is that the RAM is not soldered on. So you could actually change out the RAM, which is fantastic. Because some like the, the hardware these days of having these stuff like glued in or soldered in is just getting ridiculous so it's always nice to see when they don't do that and also it comes with a, black, a backlit keyboard and depending on which model it's a different type of keyboard one is just like a white light the other ones are rgb so if you want uh rainbow colors and stuff feel free there's to get that one uh but there's also another thing about the uh the storage is two terabytes or up to two terabytes in vme storage which is really awesome and a thin laptop and it has all the, the the necessities of you know webcam, Bluetooth, and Wi-Fi, and all that sort of stuff. And they say it has up to seven hours of battery life, which is a very nice for a reasonably powerful laptop. So that's pretty cool to see. And it also has support for USB Type C, which is fantastic because I think all hardware should have Type C now because Type C is just the best connector. Period. And like I. That's going on to a different. That's a different topic, and we won't go into that tangent. But if you're if you're looking at for a, a reasonably affordable lap, Linux laptop, and if you'd like to learn more about this laptop, uh, you'll uh, I have links to the uh, article on Front Page Linux as well as the announcement from their website in the show notes below. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. You can get started on DigitalOcean for free with a $100 credit by going to do.co slash dln. DigitalOcean is optimized for to make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and so much more. You can also get a lot of cool stuff in their marketplace. It makes it a lot easier to set up servers because you can just do like one-click installs of just you choose what kind of uh, system you want and what kind of software you want to run on it. You just click it and it just builds it out for you. It's just a fantastic thing to have like that marketplace. And they also introduced some new things like the Virtual Private Cloud or VPC, which is available for all regions free of charge. It lets you create multiple private networks to isolate your workloads, which is a fantastic feature. And I also recently did some uh, some stuff I was testing about how to set up a floating IP, and I didn't know how it was structured in, in DigitalOcean until I started doing this. And then I realized this is really ridiculously simple. All you have to do is click a link that says, right, this says, oh, you want a floating IP? Click enable now. Okay, done. Perfect. That was simple. So I really love that kind of approach. Like their dashboard is really easy to use. And if you can get all this stuff, plus access to their world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month, you can get started on DigitalOcean for free though with that $100 credit by going to do.co slash DLN will let you get that $100 credit will allow you to spin up uh, dozens of droplets or even two monster-sized droplets for two months to test out all the stuff you can do with DigitalOcean. So go do that by going to do.co slash DLN. And thanks again to DigitalOcean for sponsoring this week in Linux. Up next in the show is NVIDIA announced that they're going to be acquiring ARM for $40 billion. 
So just months after Apple announced its entire product range will be soon be shipping to ARM-based processors, ARM is being sold to NVIDIA for a lot of money, $40 billion. I don't know if that's the biggest acquisition in the tech world ever, but it seems to be up there. Because I know like the Red Hat one was like $34 billion, and that was a significantly large one too. So this is... Anyway, uh, so there's, there's some issues about NVIDIA doing, buy, buying ARM because it, and ARM is as an open licensing structure. The reason why ARM is such a huge player in the space is because of their open nature. And the NVIDIA company is not known for being open at all. And there's a lot of there's a lot of issues of people not like being comfortable with this decision of ARM selling to NVIDIA because we don't know what the outlook could be based on how they, you know, how they uh, approach open source. So for example, people would say like you can go to their GitHub and find open source stuff, but you can typically sh- like point out like and show these different sections are open because they have to be like, if they're going to support Docker, they have to have an open, uh, like a, an open layer that connects to Docker because Docker itself is open and that and the licensing requires that sort of stuff. So essentially in NVIDIA's openness is because they have to be and ARM's openness is because that's their entire infrastructure like approach. So it's it, it it's a potential of a problem that could either of one of two things, uh, NVIDIA completely uh, ag- adopts it and leaves ARM as is, and then nothing happens negatively about that, and they just use it for their uh, AI stuff, which would be really cool. Or they could totally ruin ARM and make no one want to use it, which could also be a benefit in some ways. Now, it would be a step back in terms of technology, but it also might push companies towards uh, Risk Five as an architecture to create uh, other other processors and that sort of stuff. So there is potential that even if they do bad, it could be good. So eh, it's it's a it's a long it's this is a pretty long conversation that is uh, very many many nuanced. There's even political aspects to it that you we're not going to get into it here. But I would like for you to check out Hardware Addicts ne- next episode where we talk about uh, Nvidia buying ARM in that episode very in depth because I'm not really a hardware person but this is a show that is hardware addicts so they're the other two on the on the on the show are hardware people so you would learn a lot more in that episode so check that out I have a link to that in the show notes when it comes out and also uh, check out Ask Noah show where myself and Ryan and Noah talk about this news because this is some huge news you should definitely check out the Ask Noah show and Hardware Addicts because we go into a very in-depth conversation about it and I think it is worth checking out those especially so I'll have links to both of those in the show notes below if you'd like to learn more about the NVIDIA acquiring ARM topic. Up next in the show, we have some unfortunate news that also kind of makes sense. So Mozilla has announced that they're shutting down Firefox Send and Firefox Notes. Firefox Notes, I'm not really sure why exactly they're shutting it down. They sort of address it, but, you know, anyway. The Firefox Send makes sense because of the ways it was being used by some people. So... Uh, Both of these services were created out of the Firefox test pilot program, and Firefox Send was introduced in March of 2019. I've actually been using Firefox Send for a long time for a variety of reasons. It was like such an easy way to send files back and forth to people who I knew only needed to download it one time, or if they they didn't get it in a day, I knew it would be deleted. I really liked that approach, Um, but unfortunately... There was a lot of malware and that sort of stuff being used on Firefox Send, so they didn't want to participate in that structure. But what's really cool about Firefox Send is that it was an encrypted file storage, uh, file sharing service, not storage, file sharing service. The advantages were to security, so you could set a duration of the of, of which a file will remain shared to, with others. And you set you could set passwords on those files, and you can even set number of times the files can be downloaded. Now you might be wondering why are you telling me this? Well, what's really cool, even though they're no longer going to be maintaining the cert, the, the project or the service, they have put the Firefox Send project on GitHub. So if someone wants to set it up themselves or take over the project as a community, that is possible. So I hope that someone does that because that'd be really cool. Uh, but in terms of like taking over the project to make it possible for self host, like it's already self hosting but it's no longer being maintained. So hopefully at some point someone does fork it to create their own um, and a, a community-driven project for that. That'd be really awesome. And in the announcement, Mozilla says that Firefox Send was a promising tool for encrypted file sharing. Send garnered good reach 
a loyal audience, and real signs of value throughout its life. Unfortunately, some abusive users were beginning to use Sin to ship malware and conduct spear phishing attacks and all that, that sort of stuff. They, they go on to say, This summer we took Firefox Sin offline to address this challenge. In the intervening period, as we, as we weighted the cost of the overall portfolio and strategic focus, we made the decision to not relaunch the service. And uh, so th this is unfortunate, but it also does make a lot of sense because this could be a very problematic thing for, um, you know, if you have if you have a, a platform that is being used to that degree and it's not making you money and you're actually losing money for it, it it makes sense that you would not continue to do so. And fire and Mozilla is having some like financial issues where they had to lay off some people. Uh, which is not good, of course. That's a terrible thing. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, it it's it makes sense that this would be one of their part of their decisions. So hopefully, someone does and the community pick it up and make a sin thing. But there are other alternatives. It's not like Firefox sin was the only service that existed. There's a bunch of other ones. Uh, I'm not going to list them off here because I only remember one, and I don't want to promote uh, just a one random one. So uh, we'll just leave that there. But if, you're, if you want to check it out, I have a link in to the announcement for the Firefox Send and Firefox Notes uh, shutting down from Mozilla, as well as a link to the GitHub page for their stuff, because hopefully someone would want to keep it going. Up next in the show is XFCE 4.16 pre-release. We're going to talk about the new features and the release date for it, because XFCE is known to... You know, take a while to be making new versions. So anytime there's a new version, it is something I definitely want to talk to talk about immediately. So the new features include um, uh, the continuation of the removal of the GTK2 related stuff, which is great. So it makes it a much more modern desktop being able to run on Wayland and that sort of stuff because GTK2 would not work on Wayland. So they're transitioning more of that, which is great. Uh, I'm not going to share. I'm not sure if they're by 4.16, they'll have it completely removed or not, but they're continuing that process, which is great. So there's also a new desktop icon set. They've revamped the about XFCE dialog box with more information. They've integrated uh, client side decorations or CSDs more in the system, which is good because it does make some of their applications look a lot better. I'm not a super fan of CSDs for a variety of reasons. And we could talk about that in a future video or in the post show or whatever, but in general, uh, this is good. This they also have some new uh, improvements to like uh, brand new default application dialog function. They've added something that is very important, which I'm very surprised that they added it in the way they did because this is really cool. And some DEs are missing this functionality completely, or in some ways just not as uh, specific enough. And that is fractional scaling. So if you're not familiar, fractional scaling is the ability to have high resolution displays and be able to change your interface to compensate for whatever your display is. So sometimes people will have a two times display, sometimes like a 4K or something like that, or 8K. And then sometimes people will have a 2K where it's not really a full uh, jump and like a double amount of pixels and therefore creating an issue where you need fractional scaling. So most of the time, fractional scaling is seen as 1, 1.25, 1.5, 1.75, and then 2, whereas you only have those minimal limits of fractional. And the, uh, this, the way that they're doing it is where they give you these options of like limited fractional scaling, but also you can go beyond that. So they have 1, one times, 2 times, and 1.5 times as pre-built options, but they also have custom scalings where you can just put in whatever option you want to do the scaling at, and that is fantastic. Uh, I have I can't wait to try that out because I think that'll be a very powerful thing if they did that properly because if you have the ability to specify exactly, then you can make it work to your monitor setup with the most optimum way. So that's fantastic to see. And they also have support for X uh, R and R or X render, depending on how you want to say it. And that's for like being able to resize and rotate your um, displays and stuff like that for this fractional scaling. Uh, they've also done some updates to XFCE panel, like some imp new plugins for system tray, which merges certain pieces and features into other features. So that's pretty cool to kind of like, uh, consolidate certain aspects like the status notifier and that sort of stuff. And they've also done some improvements like making the uh, the XFCE panel support dark mode if your uh, theme allows it, which is something that I, you know, I actually am a big fan of dark mode, uh, but I, because I just prefer dark mode all the time, but also I really like the idea of ha having a dark mode 
and a hybrid of dark windows and dark menus and dark panels in addition with a, a bright style theme of the application. I think that's like kind of the optimum default. So hopefully they're, they'll, they'll, do, they'll consider doing that. But I, I'm really happy that they have it functionality built into it now for the panel. It's, it's a much nicer polish approach than uh, previous uh, bright panels because I, a lot of DEs use bright panels and I think none of them should really. So there's that because the panel should not, they should be there when you need them, but not try to get your attention at all times. That's why having a very bright thing at all times on the, the corner of your peripheral vision is just odd to me. So there's that. But I'm really happy to see that XFCE is doing all these improvements to polish because XFCE is not known for polish. It's known for its reliability and its lightweight uh, resource usage and that sort of stuff. If you'd like to learn more about the release of 4.16, I'll have the links in the show notes because there's a lot more I didn't cover but I, cause I just didn't have time to cover it, but the release is not, it's just currently in a pre-release state. It's they, they said they expect it to be available in November of 2020. So I will be covering it again and hopefully have some time to test it before we cover it again, because I, I you know, I'm excited to play with the new version of XFCE. So if you'd like to learn more again, I have links in the show notes below. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the open source password manager that I use and trust, and you can go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started with your free account. Or you can get a premium account that's only $10 per year. That's right. It's that awesome. It's great software and just $10 per year. So if you're not familiar, password managers are a great way to have a balance of security and convenience when using online accounts. These days, websites always want to want you to create an account and you should create different passwords for each account on every website because that's the best practices for security. But that's also a nightmare in keeping up with all those passwords and also just making new passwords and stuff like that. So that's where Bitwarden comes in. It has a password generator to create those passwords for you and a password vault to be able to store them all for you, as well as having autofill functionality that makes it possible to insert the passwords for you so you don't have to, which is just another fantastic feature. And also Bitwarden works across all your devices like mobile, desktop, browser plugins, and even on the command line. So check out Bitwarden, the open source password manager that is just fantastic. And you can get started again by going to bitwarden.com slash DLN and you can get started with it for free or you can get the $10 premium account which is $10 per year, and you get a one gigabyte encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F, du and Duo. Uh, you also get Vault Health Reports, as well as priority customer support and much more. So make the smart move like many from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. But if you're like for me, you're like me though, you wanna, you'll just want to show your appreciation by getting that premium edition because after all, it's just $10 per year. Thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring This Week in Linux and the Destination Linux Network. Up next in the show is Library has announced their new platform called Odyssey. Now, Odyssey is a similar platform to library.tv. It works very similarly, except it also has a lot of differences in that it is more streamlined and simpler to use and also simpler to just get started with. Uh, but it does support uh, library.tv accounts. So if you have an account on Library TV, you can just use that same account to log in to Odyssey. So it's not like you have to reset up everything. That's good. Uh, and the, one of the things that I like about uh, Odyssey is that one of the things that always uh, was bothersome about Library is as a creator, when someone made it left a comment, you wouldn't be notified of that comment. Like you'd have to go manually check the video to see if it had a comment or not. So it was actually pretty difficult to do in any sort of efficient way. And with Odyssey, those notifications are now available. So all of the like the comments that you get, you can be you, even the old comments that you got on Library TV also show up in Odyssey. So you can, in case you did miss one from your manual checking, uh, you can go back and now respond to it, which I have done. So that is great. Uh, it is kind of weird that they've made this uh, new platform and at the same time are still keeping Library.tv alive. So both of them still work and both of them have different features, but Odyssey is meant to be a, um, it's like a transition alternative for YouTube. So the difference, YouTube and library are vastly different in terms of how they work and how you how you use them. However, Odyssey is quite different in that sense uh, because it's it's very similar to the uh, workflow of, of YouTube. It's not a it's not a copy. It's not trying to be a mimic, but it is 
doing it's implementing the things that are necessary to be familiar for people who are switching over, which is fantastic. So they made the discoverability of content a lot easier. You can now search through categories. They even have this uh, section that allows you to like check for just the things. It's like subscribers, but they call it following. So you you follow the channels you want to follow, and you just click that, and it shows you like all the updates from those channels in that group. So it's kind of like subscriptions. The Odyssey platform is kind of cool and also kind of confusing because they don't really fully express the difference between library.tv and Odyssey is like some things work and some things don't. Like for example, when you support something with LBC on library, that means something different from L- from supporting on Odyssey because they I don't know why that ha- why that's the case. But so in in library there's a, a concept of supporting and tipping and in uh Odyssey supporting is tipping. So eh, whatever. It's it's only been around for like a couple days, so there's still a lot to learn about this new platform. But based on my experience with the platform, it has it is an improvement. Uh, the name is uh, is not it's kind of odd. Odyssey. Eh, eh, eh. See what I did there? anyway. Uh, it's it is kind of odd still though. But at the same time, it it is easier to explain than library because with library it's like well there are no vowels. And it, whereas Odyssey, it's just like, here's how you spell it. That's fine. So there is an improvement there. And I do think that the approach they're doing for the notifications is an improvement. The discoverability is an improvement. The new design for the comment section is much better. Like it has improved quite a bit. So I am still using Odyssey uh, and I'm also still using library because I don't know which one is necessarily the best for the creator side, but in terms of users, I would say that Odyssey is probably the better option. So go check that out. I'll have a link to it in the show notes for both the Destination Linux channel as well as the Tux Digital or my channel and the links below. Up next in the show is some interesting news that we're going to talk about related to Mark Shuttleworth's comments on the Ubuntu uh, Community Council. And now this is a, a pretty deep topic, so we'll get to, we're going to cover a lot of stuff. Uh, but the the the, it's the history of the community the Ubuntu Community Council is that uh, six years ago the uh, community uh, leader, I guess the commu- the Ubuntu community leader, uh, John O'Bacon, decided to leave that position. And since then, there's kind of been like a weird void in that. And that for a, a longest time, uh, it, it they had still kept having biweekly um, meetings in their IRC and stuff like that to talk about how to improve Ubuntu and where it's going and that sort of stuff. But that also kind of gradually stopped happening. And then therefore there was a there was a comment or, or a post talking about this on the discourse forum for Ubuntu. And inside of this this conversation, uh, somebody said the uh, uh, B Carenza. I'm sorry if I messed that up. Uh, wrote on their discourse that that he thinks that Mark had abandoned the community and has been silent on the collapse of the governance of the community council. This led to a lot of conversation and also Mark himself having responded to this. So we'll get to that in a second. But uh, B. Carenza says, uh, it seems to him that Mark no longer sees much benefit in the community, so ultimately he doesn't feel the community is a partner and doesn't need the sol- uh, to solicit feedback or engage with the community. He, sa- he suggests that Shuttleworth should establish a proper Ubuntu foundation that owns the trademarks and a board with majority canonical staff as members and some seats for the community. They do actually have an Ubuntu foundation, just to be clear. This foundation is not maybe what he wants or whatever, but it it is a, it does exist. So Ubuntu foundation is a, a it's really interesting approach because they structured it uh, thanks to Neil, the patrons in the, in the patron chat, that uh, they structured it to where if the company fails, all of the trademarks and copyrights and all that stuff will fall to the Ubuntu Foundation. So even if Canonical does fail, Ubuntu wouldn't have to go, you know, suffer from it. But Shuttleworth uh, initially responded that while he recognized the frustrations being expressed, he he's not been absent. Instead, he, he said that he had been he had set aside all of other interests and concerns to help Ubuntu get into a position of long-term sustainability, which is very important for a company to have if you want it to keep it working, you know. So, he says that he's been pushing hard to make Ubuntu a major player on the far more pro- uh, profitable cloud, Internet of Things, and Kubernetes. Shuttleworth also recently said uh, Canonical is now self-sustaining as well 
which is fantastic. So in this uh, post, he says this, and he goes he goes on to say uh, he was unsure he was unsure how to restructure a community leadership function that can perform real satisfying work that requires dedication and judgment, but also generates a reward for those who put in that effort. So Shuttleworth has said that he's he's not absent. He also is just focused on something that you know you need to make sure your company is self sustaining, and otherwise otherwise you know it won't be sustained. That's how that works. If for those who did not know that, and later on in the in the thread, Walter, uh, he's an Ubuntu developer. He volunteered to help reset the community council and run its next election. And Shuttleworth took him up on this offer. Says that he's uh, having considered over the weekend uh, with Walter's offer to help run the process. Let's go ahead and call for nominations to the community council. Uh, he says, like, apologies again for having dropped the ball on this. Uh, Walter announced that he, we, we, we will be filling all seven seats this term with terms lasting for two years. To be eligible, a nominee must be an Ubuntu member. Ideally, they should have a vast understanding of the Ubuntu community, be well organized, and be a natural leader. Uh, Shutterworth says that the now plans to restore the, uh, Ubuntu, the Ubuntu Community Council and that they're going to be allowing people to, for two weeks, nominate for, you can actually nominate yourself too. So you can go to nominate someone or including yourself and send an email with the nominee's name and the launchpad ID to council at list.ubuntu.com email address. I'll have all this details in the in the show notes below. So if you want to actually, you know, get, you know, submit someone to nominate or whatever or yourself, I'll have all that information below. The nominations will be accepted for a period of two weeks until September 29th uh, at um, 1159 UTC time. So I think this is interesting that they're doing it. Dog does too. So I think this is interesting. And so he like the weird thing is that people acted like promoted as in that, that he doesn't care. Like if he doesn't care about the community and he doesn't care about the Linux ecosystem and the, the overall kind of thing, why would he be in this um, position? Why would he even create, spend the time to uh, invest his own money in creating a company and been working on it for 16 years? Like, if he didn't care, why would he even be involved? So it's ridiculous for people to say that he doesn't care. And it just, you know, gets, people make, you know, people do make mistakes, of course. You know, Canonical has not been perfect over the years. But to act like he doesn't care at all is just annoying to me because, of course, he does. Otherwise, he wouldn't even be involved. He wouldn't be here still. He wouldn't be working on the company still. So it's kind of interesting because this was, a, this, there's, Canonical has this position where, a lot of people are negative towards Canonical. And I don't think that it's a fair thing to do to be negative against Canonical at the way that it's the community has done for many years. Because Canonical has done a lot for the desktop. Like, a lot of stuff for the desktop. And it just seems ungrateful that there's so many people who hate on them. And most of the time, they hate on them for they don't even understand the thing that they're hating on them for. Like, for example, people saying that Unity was something that was terrible and that it was, um, you know, not worth doing or whatever. They shouldn't have, you know, it's not invented here syndrome and that's why they did it and all this other stuff. And actually, Unity was great as a great DE and they really didn't have a choice in making it. They pretty much had to make it. And I... Actually, I put a post on the Patreon and the sponsors for this channel and this show, and I t and we did a poll to find out what is the next big topic for like a com complex topic that I was going to cover to go into like the intricacies of like how this works and the unity and why it's good and why it was needed at the time was the winner of that poll. So if you'd like to be a participant in those polls, then uh, you need to become a patron, go to tuxdigital.com slash Patreon or slash sponsors to learn more. And uh, that's where you can vote on those. But this is, I think that that I, that needs to be said. So I'll make a, I'm making a video about that. So uh, be sure to subscribe if you're interested in that kind of thing. Up next in the show, and the last topic for today, is Deepin 20 has been released. So Deepin is a distribution of Linux based on Debian. This is this current version is based on Debian 10.5 Buster series, and they have done a huge overhaul of the look and feel of the interface. Now, some people would agree that this is a good thing. Some people would disagree with that that's a good thing. So it depends on your perspective of whether you like this new interface style. But it is a very, very different style from their previous version. Uh, there, there's still some similarities overall, but there's it's a significant difference. Uh, there's uh, They say that there's fresh graphics interface. There's smooth animation effects has been added. Uh, colorful New colorful icons. Rounded corner windows has been added. Uh, they have support for dark and light themes out of the box. 
and also more granular level tweaking, such as the ability to control the transparency adjustments, uh, color temperature settings, power and battery settings, and more. They've also done some upgrades to their notification system, where it plays a sound when a message comes in, shows messages on the lock screen, and also shows messages or not, if you want to, in the notification center. So there, this is pretty interesting, because I think Deepin is one of the uh, one of the distros that is... Uh, you know, touted as being like the most good looking interfaces and the best looking distros. They also have like a really nice app store in terms of how they designed it. Uh, as far as like usability of it, it's uh, in it's in Chinese, so I don't understand what most of it says. But design wise, it looks really good. Uh, so I think that a lot of a lot of distros should like take Deepin's store as a concept of like a base of design and like maybe consider that because it is done very well. Um, but they've also done a lot of improvements to their system overall, and they added fingerprint support if your laptop has a fingerprint sensor and that sort of stuff. So there are some cool things in it. And it is based on Debian, which is interesting because it's a because Debian is not known for the having the latest and greatest software, whereas the interface of Deepin kind of is like a dichotomy sort of thing where they don't seem to fit that well. But it's, it's an interesting approach to how they did it. Uh, but I do want to say that... Um, the interface of the new Deep in Linux reminds me a lot of the new um, Big Sur thing from Apple. And I don't necessarily like the Big Sur design from Apple. And in turn, I also don't really like this design from Deepin. I think Deepin has, is known for a long time as being one of the best looking distros. And I would agree it's one of the best looking DEs for sure for a long time. Uh, especially like the last version of Deepin was very nice looking. But I'm not really a fan of this one. I'm curious what you think. Uh, do you like the Big Sur style? Uh, let me know in the comments below what you think of their new design style. Do you like the older versions? Do you like this one? Are you a fan of the Big Sur design? Uh, let me know in the comments below. And I'd like to have a conversation about that. Uh, so I'll have links to the release notes for Deep and 20 in the show notes below. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show, please like that smash button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support the Tux Digital channel, we have multiple ways to contribute via Patreon, uh, sponsors, PayPal, and many more. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute. Or you can order the Linux is, Ever t in Linux is Everywhere t-shirt, which is a shirt I designed to con convey the message that whether or not you know Linux is there, it probably is. Go to dlnstore.com to get yours, as well as many other things, because there's mugs, hoodies, shirts, stickers, all sorts of stuff at the DLN store. So dlnstore.com. And we also have ways to contribute without any cost to you yet by using our affiliate links. You can find links for places like Amazon, Private Internet Access, Humble Bundle, and many more by going to tuxdigital.com slash affiliates. Also, if you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux and Hardware Addicts, as I'm a co-host of those shows on the Destination Linux network. And just a reminder, this show is now streaming live every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern, so join us in the live chat room to discuss all the latest Linux news each week. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with the Destination Linux network, and as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux. And I'll see you next week for another episode of your weekly source of Linux good news.